Okay. Okay. So, um, well, um, thank you for, for allowing me to present here. I hope that's okay with, with the sound for you. I guess it is. Um, my name is uh, Jan Thun, and uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Hamburg University. Um, my PhD project is about uh, elements of a transmedia and ontology. So, actually, um, I'm an ontologist, and well, I'm uh, not that much of an ontologist or a half realist or a philosopher even. Um, interesting time for me. Um, one of the core questions I attempt to, to answer in my PhD project is how the conventionally distinct media of the novel, the film, and the computer game present um, fictional worlds. Um, what I'm going to do today, however, is uh, focusing on a brief discussion of how the medium-specific ways in which the gameplay of the real-time strategy game Warcraft 3 and the massive multiplayer online role-playing game World of Warcraft is enriched by and contributes to the transmedia presentation of uh, the fictional World of Warcraft. Might lead to confusion. I'm talking about uh, the game World of Warcraft and the fictional World of Warcraft. Not the same thing, obviously. Um, so in other words, I'm not going to present uh, hardcore structuralist or formalist ontology um, here, and I'm not going to present hardcore uh, structuralist or formalist ontology here, um, but rather something different. Uh, what I'm going to do is make some introductory remarks about uh, games worlds and transmedia storytelling. Computer strategy game Warcraft 3, and um, then I'll take a brief look, even briefer look, uh, at the massive multiplayer online role-playing game World of Warcraft, and finally i come to some sort of conclusion. So let me begin by uh, saying something about the relation between computer games and fictional worlds. Contemporary computer games often use a variety of narrative techniques such as cutscenes or scripted sequences of events and the events thus presented are generally highly determined before the game is played. However, the actual gameplay mainly consists of presentations of events that are de determined in the moment of playing, so uh, while the player is interacting with the game spaces and are uh, therefore more precisely characterized as simulation instead of narration. Um, the movements of the player-controlled units in the game of Warcraft 3 or of the player's avatars in the battlegrounds of World of Warcraft occur as a result of the player's interaction with the game space, which is partly determined by the various game rules, um, but clearly not as fully predetermined as the generally narrative elements presented through narrative techniques such as cutscenes or scripted. Um, um, the distinction between rule-governed simulation and predetermined narration does not necessarily imply that only generally narrative elements are contributing to the presentation of fictional worlds. In fact, the way in which computer games present fictional worlds cannot and should not be reduced to either simulation or narration, since it's um, precisely constituted by the complex interplay of um, both modes of presentation. But what is the relation between um, fictional worlds and its presentations in a computer game? All presentations of fictional worlds are necessarily incomplete and players adhering to what is known as the reality principle or the principle of minimal departure use their world knowledge to fill in the blanks when trying to imagine these um, kinds of worlds. While the question of how we construct mental representations of fictional worlds is certain, certainly relevant um, and interesting and worth tackling, obviously, it still um, has to be emphasized that uh, fictional worlds are neither their um, media presentations, nor their mental representations. Accordingly, Jens Eder argues, um, that's German, but I'll uh, translate it later on, so he argues, jede fiktive Welt ist ein kommunikatives Artefakt, das durch die intersubjektive Bildung mentaler Repräsentationen mit Hilfe fiktionaler Texte entsteht. Fiktive Welten formen einen Gesamtzusammenhang, ein System, das neben Figuren und ihren Beziehungen auch deren verschiedene Kontexte umfasst. Eine raumzeitliche Umgebung, unbelebte Gegenstände, Situationen und Ereignisse, Normen und Gesetzmäßigkeiten. And this roughly translates to um, where is it? Uh, every fictional world is a communicative artifact that is constituted through the intersubjective construction of mental representations based on fictional texts. Fictional worlds are systems that include not only characters and their relations, but also spatial temporal environments, inanimate objects, situations and events, norms and rules. 
However, this simulation aspect makes it difficult to determine which elements of a computer game contribute to the presentation of such an intersubjective fictional world. In his discussion of the relation between rules and fiction in half real, Jesper Juhl, yes, by Juhl, observes that the presentation of fictional worlds in computer games is often not only incomplete, but also incoherent. Um, he's not quite clear about that, but I'd say the presentation is incoherent, not necessarily the, word, the, the words presented. Um, this leads him to believe, leads Juhl to believe that uh, by game conventions, the player is aware that it is optional to imagine the fictional world of the game. While I agree with you that constructing the mental representation of a complex fictional world while playing a computer game is often optional, I'd uh, argue that the problem should not be reduced to the game inviting the player to construct such a fictional world and the player being able to refuse the invitation and still play the game, in Ewell's words. Instead, one can distinguish between at least two kinds of fictional presentations. Firstly, there's a local kind of presentation that cues players into imagining fictional entities situated in rather subjective fictional worlds. And secondly, certain parts of contemporary computer games may also contribute to a more global presentation of intersubjective fictional worlds, often expanding beyond the games themselves. Now, obviously, this distinction is uh, especially productive if one looks at computer games from, a, uh, from the perspective of transmedia and narratology and moreover remembers that many contemporary computer games are um, refer to rather elaborate narrative context, um, even if they are not part of one of the most, more visible transmedia storytelling franchises. So um, while the fictional worlds of The Matrix and Star Wars, um, both of which are well, primary examples of um, uh, transmedia storytelling franchises, um, are both originating in commercially successful movies, um, it seems to me that um, transmedia storytelling franchises originating in commercially successful computer games become more and more common. I'm not sure if this is a really like a strong uh, historical hypothesis, but, but it's a, well, uh, it appears to be the case to me. Um, at least one can um, assert that the fictional world to which the gameplay of the massive multiplayer online role-playing game World of Warcraft refers was first introduced by the real-time strategy games. games of Warcraft series, that is Warcraft, Orcs and Humans, Warcraft 2. Um, as well as their various add-ons. However, the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft is not exclusively presented through these games and their official web. Mercantiles and fan fictions. But um, while the gameplay of Warcraft 3 and World of is clearly enriched by this transmedia narrative context, not all elements of the games themselves contribute equally to the presentation of the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft. Um, that's uh, actually my main point. <coughs> Going to continue with some remarks uh, on Warcraft 3 after this. Mm. The single player mode of Warcraft 3 uses a variety of narrative techniques to prevent the story of Prince Arthur's being seduced by the demonic sword Frostmourne and murdering his father to become a death knight of the Lich King. Um, I guess you are sort of familiar with that story. Um, accordingly, players will watch pre-rendered cinematic style cutscenes conveying events that are of similar importance to the story, as well as a significantly greater number of Machinima style cutscenes um, mainly used for conveying dialogue between characters. Moreover, the loading skills, uh, <coughs> the loading screens between levels use maps and small language-based narrations to situate the various game spaces within the story and the fictional world of Warcraft. Uh, and finally, the players will experience a variety of scripted events within these game spaces. While the events conveyed through narrative techniques are not always highly relevant for the unfolding story or the player's understanding of the fictional world of Warcraft, um, they are still all predetermined elements of the designer story. Hence, um, they may be seen as more reliable with regard to the presentation of the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft than the locally simulated events of the player's story, um, which in the process of playing are determined through the rule-governed interaction of the player with the game. Now, um, leaving the question of reliability aside for the moment, um, the more emergent components of Warcraft 3's gameplay are fictional presentations as well, since the player-controlled units obviously cannot be reduced to some sort of abstract ludic function, but rather take the form of footmen, priests, knights, or even Prince Arthur himself. More precisely, 
3, the units in a real-time strategy game like Warcraft 3 are both abstract game pieces and fictional entities. As Jesper Juhl uh, notes in Half Real, um, I'm touching on Half Real Ism here. Uh, if we play a board game such as Axis and Allies, all our actions have a double meaning. We move a piece around the board, but this also means that we are invading Scandinavia with our troops. We click the keys on the keyboard, but we are also moving Lara Croft. In these examples, the actions that we perform have the duality of being real events and being assigned another meaning in a fictional world. Now, I'm not that sure if um, it's actually the case that the action of moving Lara Croft um, should itself be considered fictional, but the resulting fact that Lara Croft moves in the same way footmen, priests, and knights appearing in Warcraft 3 are not fictional in a uh, real-time strategy game, but at the same time there are fictional footman priests and knights whose locally simulated presentation cues players into imagining fictional entities. It is, however, quite a different question, at least from my perspective, if the presentation of these fictional entities contributes to the presentation of the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft. Kendall Wharton's assertion that a fictional truth consists in there being a prescription or mandate in some context to imagine something may be well, related to Ada's description of fictional worlds as collective constructs. When we read a novel or watch a movie, we are generally quite aware of what kind of fictional world we are supposed to imagine. So um, while uh, the, the fictional worlds um, we actually imagine may of course differ in detail, um, they tend to be rather similar anyway, because we know what we are supposed to imagine. Um, however, uh, in computer games, um, or when we play a computer game, things get more complex, um, at least a little bit more complex. While the presentation of simulated gameplay in Warcraft 3 may cue players to construct subjective mental representation of some fictional world, uh, which may even be rather similar to the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft, but still rather subjective representations, most players will recognize that these local presentations may differ significantly from player to player and from playing session to playing session and are therefore not stable enough to contribute reliably to the detailed presentation of the intersubjective fiction of Warcraft. If you uh, want to construct a mass subjective fiction, you need to have some sort of stability. You need to believe that other people who play the game um, have similar presentations on which they can base their representations. So, um, yes, um, mental representations of the gameplay of Warcraft by the player specific world year So, there is a relation, but not a straightforward relation between uh, the subjective fiction world of Warcraft. Um, okay, I'm going to say a few more words about World of Warcraft now. Um, First thing, the notion that there's a straightforward relationship between the fictional gameplay of a computer game and the intersubjective fictional world um, it presents, or at least the narrative elements of the game present, um, also seems to apply to the relation between fictional worlds and the social spaces of massive multiplayer online role-playing games like World of Warcraft. So there's uh, no straightforward relationship between the fictional world of Warcraft and the social spaces of World of Warcraft as well. While I cannot go into detail with regard to the social interaction between players or the practice of role-playing today, because I don't have time, it may still be helpful to explain briefly how other players influence the extent to which a massive multiplayer online role-playing game um, can contribute to the presentation of an interceptive fictional world that expands beyond the game itself. Although the world of use cutscenes and more complex forms of script events as well, large parts of Backstory are presented through rather one sided quest dialogues. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't have the opportunity to um, reinstall an English language client and make a screenshot, but it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, this is how uh, quest dialogues look in World of Warcraft. So, just as in Warcraft 3, I see, um, just as in Warcraft 3, um, the information conveyed through narrative techniques tends to be quite reliable with regard to the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft when considered out of context, but uh, the fact that World of Warcraft is played simultaneously by a very large number of players turns it into what will calls an incoherent world game. Why is this the case? In the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft, the legendary orc leader Thrall cannot be young and old at the same time, and the pirate Andri Firebeard 
cannot be alive and beheaded at the same time. Yeah, that would be uh, not logically consistent. So, however, the latter, if not the former, is routinely the case during a quest that asks all players of World of Warcraft to let their avatars fight Firebeard and return his head to the quest giving Goblin Security Chief Village Whistle. Moreover, since the quest in question is a group quest, um, actually killing Firebeard once will produce Firebeard's head up to five times, depending on uh, the number of group members. And that's sort of inconsistent as well. Um, much in the same way, um, a very large amount of avatars in World of Warcraft will routinely fight against and kill the bosses of high-level dungeons, and one of the same avatar can and usually will kill a certain boss repeatedly. Following you, we could indeed talk about events in the fictional world that we cannot explain without referring and uh, without discussing the rules in these cases. And World of Warcraft has even been described um, as a game that is essentially a mechanism to obscure the loot table, rather fittingly in my uh, opinion. Um, just as in Warcraft 3, then, players will usually be quite aware that there is no straightforward relationship between the presentation of, worlds of War World of Warcraft's simultaneously experienced but still um, rather locally simulated gameplay and the intersubjective fictional World of Warcraft, to which that gameplay at least partly refers. It is worth remembering in this context that computer games may entail large passages of time where the narrative structure is not the focus of the player's attention, that is a common practice of the players of both Warcraft 3 and World of Warcraft to skip, <coughs> to skip cutscenes and quest dialogues. This seems to resonate well with Jules' thesis that uh, construction a mental representation of um, the fictional world of a game is optional while playing. Um, but if the attention of the players shifts to the fictional aspects of World of Warcraft's gameplay, what kinds of mental representations do they construct? Um, just very shortly in her um, uh, Poetics of Virtual Worlds, Lisbeth Klaastrup rightly emphasized that users do not necessarily join a world to commune or socialize, but to play or game. Much in the same way, it should be stressed that players of World of Warcraft do not necessarily join the game primarily to experience some kind of ontological confusion with the uh, intersubjective fiction of World of Warcraft. The gaming experience may certainly be enriched by their specific world knowledge, but most of them are still mainly interested in interacting with the game spaces and will seldomly confuse the local presentation of these spaces with the global presentation of the intersubjective fiction in the world of Warcraft. Right? So players know what they're actually playing with. You, you could probably reframe that in terms of frame theory. I, I would be interested in, in hearing that. Um, however, I can't do that now. Obviously, I don't have time. I know. So I'm um, uh, to some sort of conclusion. What I've done is um, I've briefly examined the specific ways in which the of contemporary computer games is enriched by and contributes to the transmedia presentation of fictional worlds within so-called transmedia storytelling franchises. And uh, my analysis of the real-time strategy game Warcraft 3 and the massive multiplayer online role-playing game World of Warcraft has shown that the presentations generated by contemporary computer games through narrative elements as well as the interactive simulation of ludic events um, can be, maybe, should be considered fiction in at least two ways. Firstly, the complex interplay of narration and simulation so typical for contemporary computer games generates player stories that may vary widely from player to player and from playing session to playing session. While these local fictional presentations make few players to imagine some kind of fictional world, the resulting mental representations will be considered just as local and subjective as the media presentations on which they are based. So the media presentations are just local, not necessarily subjective. Secondly, Warcraft 3 and World of Warcraft do not only locally refer to the intersubjective fiction World of Warcraft, but also contribute to the global and transmedia presentation of that world. Um, in order for a fictional presentation in a computer game to be considered reliable enough to contribute to the global presentation of an intersubjective fictional world, this presentation must be reasonably stable that is, it need not vary too much from playing session to playing session and from player to player. Um, that makes it reliable. Hence, while the player stories of contemporary computer games cue players into locally imagining subjective fictional worlds is primarily their predetermined designer story that contributes to the global presentation of an intersubjective fictional world, at least uh, from my perspective. Now, obviously, this only holds for those elements of the designer story that can be considered reliable due to a lack of inconsistencies with other elements of this global presentation which at least in the case of Warcraft 3 and World of Warcraft expand beyond the games themselves. And, um, well, uh, obviously one could say 
quite a lot um, more about that, uh, which I can't because I don't have time. Um, and um, so I'm just going to emphasize one last thing. I think it's um, um, maybe more appropriate to conceive of this distinction um, as a kind of, not, not as a um, absolute, but rather of a, uh, of a gradual opposition. Um, like this, you know, gradual, between uh, intersubjective and subjective fiction words or their presentations. But still, I find uh, the proposed distinction rather helpful, useful, productive when looking at computer games, fictional worlds, and transmedia storytelling from the perspective of a transmedia neurotology. So, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> That way, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't, but. So, just a question, uh, which I would be really interested in. Uh, the world of Warcraft versus the world of World of Warcraft, are they the same fictional? I mean, the fictional world of Warcraft versus the fictional world of World of Warcraft? No, the, the point would exactly be that they are not. Right, right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, it's not a transmedial world. Well, it, certain elements of, of the uh, computer game artifact world of Warcraft um, contribute to the presentation of the intersubjective fictional world of Warcraft. But if you play World of Warcraft, um, you're not only, uh, or rather, not very um, strongly interacting with the uh, uh, fictional world of Warcraft, but rather with the game spaces, with the social spaces of the game. So that's, um, the experience of the game spaces of World of Warcraft is probably enriched by, um, by knowledge um, you have about the fictional world of Warcraft, and part of that knowledge is um, presented within the game world of Warcraft, but um, still there's no, like, no straightforward relationship between game spaces and fictional world. Yeah, they, okay, that would be the, the transmedia perspective that, that um, every game sort of um, does contribute to the presentation of the transmedia intersubjective fictional world, but um, not everything in the game contributes to it, but only certain elements. Is it the same world, fictional world? The three of those games? Yeah, yeah the, the, the fictional world, or at least from my perspective, that would be the same world. That, that would be the point in, in transmedia storytelling franchises like uh, Warcraft. So the maps are the same? Well, no, it gets tricky again because it's, it's probably, yeah, because. That's a general problem with transmedia storytelling franchises, actually. If you talk about um, different media texts um, presenting one fictional world, um, I don't know if that's um, a good idea to talk about, but I, I just did, and I tend to, to find it rather interesting, the idea of, of Henry Jenkins. Um, and you are confronted with problems of reliability because um, media texts tend not to make the same claims about a fictional world. And, well, this is something I can't go into. But there are, there are certain, um, certain criteria, criteria on which players or, um, or readers or viewers um, make decisions about reliability, I guess. Okay. That, that would be the point um, with, with 
that uh, with, with Eda's idea of a intersubjective fictional world. I mean, that that's sort of intersubjectively constructed. But um, I think there are, there are two different um, problems that you addressed. Um, the first would be um, um, reliability of uh, elements which are, well, I'd, I'd say framed to contribute to the presentation of a um, intersubjective fiction world. And the, the second problem would actually be sort of like local simulations, um, which refer to that intersubjective fiction world, but um, they are framed differently. So if, if I, I'm not really a, a role player in the, in the pen and paper sense, but um, if I do role play, um, pen and paper role play, then I, I know as a player that um, what I'm talking about here is sort of very, um, very lowly. Exactly. And then there's the other problem, which is which is like um, handshot first or whatever. You know, if, if, uh, the question if in the fictional world of Star Wars, um, presented through certain um, film texts, um, and so shot first. I'm not going to go into that, but that's sort of another kind of problem reliability that may arise um, when talking about um, transmedia storytelling franchises. Yeah, it's, um, well, there, there are various different things. Firstly, you are perfectly right that I'm, I was primarily talking about uh, um, fictional presentations in computer games with a focus on simulated gameplay, so I'm not doing the whole package, but that is um, in the context of a research project that is, among other things, interested in transmedia storytelling franchises. Um, the second point would be that transmedia storytelling franchises, at least as far as I understood Jenkins, um, are franchises where um, different media texts refer to one and the same fictional world, very, very roughly. Um, so that's not about the, the question um, whether um, comparable entities like orcs um, occur in different fictional worlds. That would be another interesting question, actually, but not one I, I've tackled here. So that, that wouldn't be transmedia storytelling in Jenkins' sense. Yeah, or, or what, what Jenkins does there is, um, is arguing that, that uh, amusement park spaces or computer game spaces uh, evoke knowledge about fictional worlds, and I'm not saying that's, well, that's plausible, but still, um, I'm not sure if, if we understand each other, um, because it's not about, about the question uh, whether the orcs in, uh, in the fictional world of Warcraft occur in, in a similar form in the fictional world of, of the Lords of the Rings. That's not what, what Jenkins 